Hello! Welcome back to this extremely delayed video. The the mic is probably still quiet. I still haven't... The, who makes a microphone to look like a box that sits... Anyway, uh, today's video is building on from what we did last time, which was carbohydrate intake on your day-to-day -day basis. Now we're going to be diving into a little bit more specific carbohydrate intake for when you're racing. So this is in intra-exercise carbohydrate intake. Endurance athletes are amazing at what they do, but why do some end up like this? This is what we call hitting the wall. The wall is a term used in the context of a marathon to refer to the point generally at about 20 miles where glycogen supplies have been exhausted and energy has to be converted from fat. This is a slower process than with glycogen and the consequential shortage of glucose to the brain may result in hypoglycemia, the scientific term for the wall. This can be extremely unpleasant experience with symptoms including a lack of physical coordination, dehydration, paresthesia, a tingling or numbness in the toes or fingers, nausea, muscle spasms, dizziness and inability to think clearly and extreme physical weakness. Research has highlighted that participants that have hit the wall have shifted their motivations from finishing the race towards survival. So it's a good idea to avoid hitting the wall. But how do we do this? Well, let's take a look at its scientific term, hypoglycemia. Hypo, meaning low, glyce, meaning sugar or glucose, and emia, meaning presence in blood. So we have a low sugar presence in the blood. We know because we've measured this in our laboratories, your blood glucose level gradually falls unless you consume carbohydrate during the exercise. This is because carbohydrate is the primary energy source we use during endurance-like activities. And once we run out of carbohydrate or our carbohydrate levels become lower and lower, our body has no choice but to start using fat as an energy source. Now this might sound all good, but fat actually takes a lot longer to get energy out of compared to carbohydrate, which means you'll finish the race slower. In fact, participants that volunteered for this study lasted approximately one hour longer when they were consuming the carbohydrate compared to when they were given a placebo. The placebo in this case was flavored water and of course, it didn't seem to help much. So the next logical question to ask is how much carbohydrate do we need? When do we need to start taking carbohydrate? Is it useful for shorter duration endurance events? Well, if we look at some research, we can find that on average, people burn around one to 1.1 grams of carbohydrate per minute. If you're well trained, you might have an increased ability to do this and you might see values around 1.5 to 1.8 grams of carbohydrate per minute. This equates to roughly 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrate per minute that you're using as energy to fuel this exercise task. Unsurprisingly, the literature recommends that endurance competitions lasting between two to three hours, you should consume 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour, and events lasting longer than 2.5 hours, you should consume up to 90 grams per hour. It's also recommended that you consume this carbohydrate in a six to eight percent solution. What this means is that for every six to eight grams of carbohydrate you have, you have on the side 100 milliliters of water that you mix in with it. Higher concentrations have been studied, however, don't appear to show any added benefit compared to six to eight percent. Additionally, consuming just one type of carbohydrate, for example, glucose alone, might actually be limiting the benefit you could be having if you were to consume multiple types of carbohydrate, such as glucose and fructose. And this is because our gut has multiple carbohydrate transporters that are specific to different forms of carbohydrate. If you just consume pure glucose, the door for glucose will open and glucose will go through. If you were to consume more and more and more glucose, you will reach a point at which no more glucose can enter 
because the doorway is not big enough. If you were to consume fructose, however, fructose has a completely different door. And so that fructose door will open and allow fructose to go in. Now the total amount of sugar your body absorbing is increased, which is why so many sport gels and sports drinks contain multiple transporter carbohydrates to allow for this increased carbohydrate uptake in the gut membrane. In fact, the question whether more carbohydrate is beneficial has been studied. There was a multi-center study that looked at varying carbohydrate intakes from zero grams per hour to 120 grams per hour, and they found that the optimal carbohydrate was around 78 grams per hour. This sits nicely within the recommendation of 60 to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour of exercise. Now, some individuals might not be able to tolerate high levels of carbohydrate due to gastrointestinal issues. Some people might feel discomfort in their stomachs. Some people might feel nausea. There are a variety of symptoms that you may experience. So this is why it's always recommended to try this in your training rather than in competition for the first time as this can be quite risky. And if you start to experience negative symptoms by consuming too much carbohydrate, you might actually be harming your performance, which would make you slower. The form of carbohydrate you take, for example, solids, semi-fluids such as gels, or fluids such as sports drinks, has been shown to not alter the effect that the carbohydrate has on you. What this means basically is that the science recommends that you trial and error various types of carbohydrates to suit you and to suit your competition. However, most endurance athletes prefer semi-solids such as gels or fluids in sports drinks because they're easier to transport around with you and they're also a lot easier to consume whilst you're exercising. Try running whilst eating some toast or a banana. It's a lot more difficult compared to just taking sips of a drink. However, it's recommended, and I will be making another video on this, that when you start to intake carbohydrate, it starts to change the osmolarity of your gut. So it's worth considering whether you appear to be dehydrated, or in fact, and potentially more seriously, hyperhydrated, when you consume too much water, which can lead to hyponatremia, which is a low sodium presence in the blood. But I'll be talking about this in another video. It's just something to be cautious of. But why is this all important? Well, performance in general has been shown to increase, especially in endurance events lasting longer than 90 minutes when you consume carbohydrate during the exercise. The International Society of Sports Nutrition also highlight that this is the case and I look through some of the references they used to back up this statement and the meta-analyses and systematic views that they studied. One of them found that especially in events lasting longer than 90 minutes, carbohydrate intake during exercise does appear to be likely favorable to increase your performance. However, they found questionable results when the performance was less than 70 minutes. So this brings us to the next question. Is carbohydrate intake useful for shorter duration events. Well, assuming that you've had breakfast that day and you're not in a fasted state, then the studies have found mixed results. And in fact, it becomes a little bit more interesting to find that you don't actually have to swallow the carbohydrate to potentially find a performance enhancing effect. If your event lasts between 35 and 75 minutes, simply putting carbohydrate solutions in your mouth swirling it around for five to ten seconds and then spitting it back out appears to enhance endurance performance. Now studies have actually found inconsistent findings with regard to this so it may happen, it may not happen if you were to try this and there are a lot more factors we need to consider which is why research is still ongoing at this point to determine whether mouth rinsing is actually beneficial to you. Now the mechanism behind mouth rinsing and actually eating carbohydrate is completely different for these short duration events. You might be thinking, well, don't we need to eat the carbohydrate in order to get the energy from it? Well, in fact, in these short duration events, carbohydrate storage doesn't appear to be a limiting factor compared to if you were to do a long race where it does become a limiting factor. So how are we getting a benefit by simply putting carbohydrate in our mouth and spitting it back out. It's rather counterintuitive. However, the current theory 
is as follows. As it turns out, there are taste receptors in your oral cavity that when they detect carbohydrate, sweetened or unsweetened, send electrical signals to your brain. So I've decided to re-record this part because I was rambling on and wasn't making much sense. When we exercise, our brain tries to keep our body's internal environment stable. We call this homeostasis. This is to protect us. Therefore, in order to help prevent our internal environment becoming unstable, our brain slowly inhibits its motor drive to the muscle. What this means is that our muscles are getting fewer signals from the brain to contract, meaning that they have no choice but to contract less forcefully. We can call this central fatigue. Central because it's the brain's fault. However, when our taste receptors in our mouth detect carbohydrate, the signals they send to the brain might actually switch off this central fatigue response to some degree meaning that our brain maintains motor drive to the muscles and we see an improvement in performance compared to if we were to just drink water instead. However, the study's findings are mixed so far, so it may or may not work if you were to try this. The method to mouth rinse appears to be a 6-8% carbohydrate solution, as we've discussed, rinsing in the mouth for 5-10 to 10 seconds and then spitting it back out. Now, if you want to swallow it, that's fine, but the benefits don't appear to be any greater than if you were to spit it back out. Now, if you were to swallow it, it is a little bit of solution. It might cause some distress, it might not. We simply don't know, which is why personal preference always comes at the top, normally in these scenarios. Now, for ultra endurance events, there's been a completely brand new International Society of Sports Nutrition review done on this, so I'll make a whole new video dedicated to ultra endurance carbohydrate intake and also the other components of nutrition once I have time to go through them all. But for now, I'll leave you with this table and hopefully you can use it at your own expense to benefit yourself. These are the recommendations by the science.